Hi, uh, good morning or afternoon, everyone, depending on where you're located or evening. My name is Karen Berman, and I'm the CEO of the American Society of the University of Haifa. I want to thank you all for joining us today for our webinar on Minding Your Mental Health with Dr. Eli Zomer, who will discuss the psychological impact of the corona pandemic. Dr. Zomer is a clinical psychologist and a full professor emeritus of psychology at the University of Haifa School of Social Work, one of the leaders in its discipline in the region. Our School of Social Work, which is part of our Faculty of Social Welfare and Health Sciences, is dedicated to the development and guidance of training and research professionals who will become leaders and activators of social change. Our location in the north of Israel uniquely positions the school to serve as a diverse and multicultural community and allows our students to interface and address issues of social justice, accessibility, health, and welfare. We are incredibly proud of the work we do and its impact on Israel and the world, and we're fortunate to have Dr. Zomer with us today. Dr. Zomer has been treating survivors of trauma for over 30 years, first as a mental health officer in the IDF and later as a civilian clinician for survivors of terrorism and prolonged childhood trauma. He's been published in more than 100 scientific journals, and in 2014, he received a Lifetime Achievement Award for his work. Again, I want to thank you all for joining us today. I know uh, it's some very uncertain times, and we appreciate uh, being able to reach out to you as our community at this time. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Zomer and to Jake Scharfman, who will take us through the conversation. Thank you so much, Karen, uh, and welcome to all our guests uh, from around the world. As Karen mentioned, today we're joined by Dr. Eli Zomer from the University of Haifa School of Social Work, who is uh, going to brief us on the mental health implications of the coronavirus crisis. Um, as of this afternoon, Israel's coronavirus cases have exceeded 2,600, and the death toll has now reached eight. Uh, with the government continuing to tighten self-quarantine and travel restrictions, Isolation can have a wide ranging ramification uh, for individuals with or without pre existing mental health conditions. Dr. Zomer will be discussing the short and the long term uh, psychological effects of isolation um, on, on how it affects different age groups and ways to lessen the impact of stress and anxiety during this period of confinement. Uh, after this interview, we will also, as usual, open it up to questions from the audience, um, which you can submit at any time during this briefing via Zoom uh, using the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen, not the chat button, but the Q&A button on the bottom of your Zoom screen, or by emailing uh, info at asuh.org. Uh, again, that's info at as, as in Sam, uh.org. So, doctor... Um, you know, physically, uh, the elderly and those with pre-existing uh, medical conditions, we know are most vulnerable um, if, it, if infected with COVID-19. Um, however, are there, more, are there people more liable to be affected by the virus on a psychological level than others? Yes, I think that um, uh, people can endure only so much stress because the stress is becoming accumulative. So if you look at uh, uh, vulnerable groups such as immigrants or migrant workers, for example, uh, these are individuals who have seen a lot of change in their lives and uh, either to adjust uh, to uh, new rules and new, new situations and invest a lot of resources in adaptation. So they are uh, an example of, uh, of um, obvious risk groups, but there are others. There are others. For example, uh, people with uh, deficient social support, uh, people who are socially shy, socially anxious. Uh, these are individuals who need support, who need others, but uh, don't have the skills to acquire it. Um, Moving again to, to uh, some more social, social variables, I would say the unemployed. Again, if you look at stress as something that is accumulative and you count in the life of people the number of stressors they have to, uh, ha have to endure during a particular given year, those who have been recently laid off and unemployed are at higher risk. People suffering, of course, from other pre-existing mental disorders would be at risk. Uh, people with anxiety disorders, depression, um, people with post-traumatic stress disorders, uh, survivors or people who lived uh, near the perimeter of uh, the 9-11 would be at a little higher risk. But let me uh, just point out, I mean, it could go on with, uh, with the list of, of populations at risk, but um, 
this situation is, is uh, unique in the sense that we tell people to stay at home where it is safer. But we must bear in mind that for some people, home is not safe. So battered women uh, or um, children who are neglected or abused uh, are ironically and paradoxically put at higher risk under these kind of circumstances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The University of Haifa's nursing department um, is currently embarking on a campaign to help the elderly population throughout northern Israel um, and with many unable to receive uh, the care that they properly need. Can you expand a little bit um, on the mental health of the elderly population right now and how mental health um, you know, can affect uh, them trying to get through this pandemic? I, I think this is a, an extremely valuable initiative because uh, the elderly uh, need to cope with a variety of challenges. Uh, they're the physical uh, frail uh, condition uh, notwithstanding, but uh, of course uh, many of them uh, suffer from uh, mild uh, age-appropriate cognitive decline <coughs> And they will be much slower to adapt to rapidly changing situations, much slower to follow the, the, the barrage of, 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 of information that, is, uh, that, is, uh, uh, that they need to expose themselves to. And there, of course, there will be other difficulties because uh, many of the uh, older populations would be uh, hearing impaired and uh, would have uh, problems with their eyesight. So they would find it very confusing to, to try to follow all, all these instructions. And of course, um, they are, they are uh, the most vulnerable uh, to this particular virus. So uh, um, all means of control is taken away from them. They need to be confined to their homes, confused and bewildered. So this initiative is of, of, of uh, paramount importance. Mm. Is it possible that people with no previous mental health issues at all can develop, you know, adverse psychological symptoms from this? Um, yeah, well, the development of, of widespread uh, stress reactions in, in the population at large is uh, related to several factors. Uh, for example, the predictability of the situation. So that affects us all. The situation is unpredictable. People, the experts tell us that uh, it is, uh, we, we, we will know only in two weeks' time, you know, what will be the situation in terms of the contagion. So in the current case, uh, the, the medical and the economical trajectories are an unknown, a complete unknown, and, 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 and lack of information, lack of uh, ability to predict the future is a major stressor. So this increased um, uncertainty uh, under, under threat, under duress, is uh, potentially traumatic. And so what we need is a flow of trustworthy information and what, uh, is, uh, what, what is implied from what I'm saying is that one needs to be aware of, uh, beware of rumors because in such situations of uncertainty, uh, people try to uh, uh, create information that will give them a more sense of security. But often this kind of information can be what is now known as fake news, but uh, you know, I, I'm aware, I'm, I've already identified myself, a lot of misinformation floating uh, in the social media. So you need, to have, you need to have trust in the leadership. And I know in, in the United States, you have different styles of leadership. You have leadership, one style of leadership coming from the White House, another style of leadership coming from, for example, the governor of, of New York. Uh, so the, st the trust in the leadership will predict stress and stress reaction. The, the more people are able to trust their leader, the more uh, uh, confident they will be. Mm -hmm. And um, another important factor that can affect uh, the, the well-being of the population at large is the cohesion of the community. To what extent people are helping others, but the cohesion could be also not only on a, on a community level, but also the family level. So families who are strong and have good solid relationships, will fare better in terms of mental health uh, than family that are characterized by conflict. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so, but just to end uh, this, uh, my, my uh, answer to this question, um, what characterizes the current situation is that people are not able to transform their anxiety into action. So that is to do something about their situation. Usually the best way of coping is, um, is solve, problem solving coping. When you do something to, to solve the situation, the, the challenge ahead of you. Um, and we know from research on the battlefield stress that soldiers who are incapacitated or are under duress because of an artillery uh, bombardment are more prone to post-traumatic stress disorder than uh, infantry units who are doing you know, what they've been trained to do. Mm-hmm. So the current situation is one in which uh, the civilians uh, are asked to do nothing. And that's, that worries me. So we need to find ways to um, uh, uh, encourage people to become more proactive and get, get better control over their environment, immediate mm-hmm. environment. Yeah. And I think this is a follow-up question to that. But, you know, the, the World, Ho- World Health Organization put out some guidelines for people who are feeling stressed, anxious about the outbreak. Some suggestions included, uh, you know, avoiding the news, seeking out only critical updates from legitimate sources. What do you recommend people can do uh, to manage their stress and anxiety in this, yeah. uh, in this difficult time? Yeah. Well, it is important to get the facts because there's, the situation is constantly changing and uh, information is flowing. Uh, but once you have uh, 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 hunkered down and, 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 and uh, establish yourself in your home, there's not much more information except stressful information to, uh, to digest. So people need to monitor and, 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 and control the stream of news about the pandemic. <coughs> um, and people differ. Uh, people differ in their needs for information. Some people get distressed if they don't have constant access to to information about a stressful situation, but others um, um, f- others uh, don't need the information. If they can sense that, okay, I'm trusting the leadership to do what is needed and I cannot control it, I'd rather not be exposed. So people need to uh, use their own judgment of what is best for them. Um, um, however, uh, if you do get information, try to do it from a trusted website. Uh, and if you don't have access, you're not computer savvy, ask your family members to uh, supply you with uh, information perhaps once or twice a day so you won't be bombarded by too much information. Right. Israel has experienced, uh, I think as of now, when we started this briefing, eight fatalities uh, from the virus. I believe three or so have occurred within the past 24 hours. Um, when people start to, to, to die because of this virus, um, how does that change the mindset of the country psychologically? Well, I think it has changed it uh, in, in, a visible, in a visible manner. The, this development has decreased denial about the gravity of, of the threat. And uh, to my mind, it had contributed to uh, a, a very improved compliance with uh, um, the social distancing instructions. So, uh, of course, what also helps is the, the government decrees that are now official and, and punishable and enforceable. So the result here is that um, uh, people, uh, people are um, uh, really complying. Uh, I think it has hit. The information has, has been digested that um, the COVID-19 uh, carriers, the number of carriers in, in this country is doubling every three days. This is very worrying. So um, compliance is, is absolutely necessary if we don't want to overwhelm the intensive care units in, in, uh, by Passover. Sure, sure. For those individuals living alone, uh, whether they're young or, or old, I mean, what, what do you foresee as the short-term or even long-term effects of this government-mandated isolation? Maybe they're not in a complete quarantine, but, you know, as, at this point, everyone, uh, you know, almost is in some sort of quarantine. So as, as people, you know, have to be inside, especially if they're alone, not much interaction with another, you know, human being, or, or what, what's kind of the, 
the short term and long term effects that you see from that uh, possibly taking place? Yeah, it is, it is difficult to make uh, uh, globally sweeping statements because the outcome of isolation for those uh, living alone uh, depends on several factors. For example, uh, their familiarity and their deg the degree of comfort with uh, this kind of home confinement. And what I mean by that is that we need to remember that many of those who live alone do this by choice and enjoy their, their solitude. Because solitude is not necessarily loneliness. It's, it's a way of, uh, of existing, of being that is preferable to many. So for those, um, you know, I'm not worried about um, this uh, section of the population, but uh, for people who are um, not psychologically resilient, who, who, who live by themselves because the option of intimacy or, or um, um, forming a relationship is, is non-existent because of their anxieties, because of their traumatic history, these individuals are at high risk. So um, we must, um, if this uh, uh, carries on for much longer, we need to prioritize who to reach out to. The elderly are the obvious uh, uh, subsection of the population to reach out to, but people with uh, mental pre-existing mental health conditions who are isolated because of their lack of social skills uh, are another subgroup uh, who need to be uh, supported in these difficult times. Right, sure. H how do you recommend parents talk about the virus with their young children? Uh, is it possible for children, or even adults for that matter, to experience or develop PTSD from the long-term confinement and anxiety? I mean, what, or, and, and furthermore, what impact on a child um, does it have to not go to school or not go outside and play with their friends um, and things of that nature, engaging with, you know, their peers? Well, the current situation that we are all uh, experiencing globally is stressful, and I could say perhaps even uh, highly stressful for some. But to my mind, it is not of, of traumatic potential. Uh, because, uh, of course, witnessing, God forbid, someone dying uh, at home because of, of, of the illness could obviously be traumatic. But the home confinement in itself is not the kind of, event, uh, the kind of event that could generate post-traumatic stress disorder. However, uh, the ch children are, are vulnerable. Are vulnerable because they don't understand the, perhaps the, the situation and they take their cues from their parents. So I would tell, uh, advise parents to remember that children um, uh, will react to both what uh, you say and also how you say it. The children will pick up cues from conversations that the parents have and with them or, or among themselves and will react emotionally uh, accordingly. So I think that parents should make themselves available to, to, to their children to listen, to, to listen and to talk, uh, make time uh, to talk, and be sure that the children um, can come to them whenever they have questions. Um, I think we need to pay attention to what the children see or hear on television or radio and consider reducing the amount, the amount of screen time mm -hmm. and exposure to, uh, to information about the, the, the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And um, provide um, information that is honest and accurate, but that is uh, uh, tuned to their level of understanding and to what they need to know. Don't overwhelm, overwhelm them. Uh, and of course, lastly, I would say, teach the children and repeat these instructions, the everyday actions to reduce the spread of germs. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Very important point. Um, your research uh, includes kind of a, a groundbreaking study on, on daydreaming actually. Um, do you think that allowing oneself to daydream a bit each day is a safe way to escape the, the current situation that we're living in? Daydreaming is a doctor's prescription, you mean? Well, mm -hmm. look, um, uh, we all daydream. Daydreaming is, is, a normal, is a normal mental behavior. 
uh, and my my research focused on a very specific kind of daydreaming that uh, involves a capacity to daydream very vividly uh, to the extent that people have a sense of presence in their fantasies. Um, this kind of daydreaming is volitional. It's not like uh, the mind drifting off in, you know, in mind wandering. So daydreaming is um, a, a very normal and important uh, mental activity, as I said. Um, too much of it, of course, come, could come at the expense of, um, of uh, important daily uh, functioning. So uh, under, under the current uh, circumstances, if you have been daydreaming, even if you have been dating uh, extensively, since there's nothing much we could do, about the external situation, uh, tuning in into your uh, internal entertainment system is could be a good idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we, we've seen a bit less of this in Israel than in the U.S., um, but I, I know a lot of our viewers are are, are likely in the United States. Um, we've seen a lot of panic buying to an extreme in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, what, are, what do you think are some factors, not necessarily, you know, pertaining exactly to Americans and their, and their behaviors, but what do you think are some factors that, include, that, that, that influence, sorry, anxiety-driven public behavior in stressful times? Well, to me, this behavior is, is an indication of lack of trust in the system. Um, I think that if people do not believe that the government will take care of them, that the government will make sure that the supply lines uh, are, are con will continue to work through the crisis, if people also don't uh, trust their neighbors to, to behave in a neighborly way, uh, then you must uh, stock up and you must uh, not only stock up on, on, uh, on food and other supplies, but maybe on guns, which is a unique American phenomenon because nowhere else in the world <clears throat> people line up in these uh, difficult times to arm themselves with ammunition and weapons. So I don't know what this means um, when people do that, but it certainly does not connote a trust in the system and in the government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Doctor, if any, to, to kind of bring a little bit of um, light and positivity, but if any, do you think um, that there could be any potential benefits uh, to this unprecedented global pandemic? Well, we already see the benefit for the environment. Uh, mm -hmm. Dolphins are now swimming in the canals of Venice. Imagine this. Mm -hmm. uh, from the satellites, you could see clearly uh, the, uh, the the smog disappearing. And this is uh, this is really wonderful, but unfortunately, very short lived. However, on a personal level, on a psychological level, I mean, what we have here is an abundance of of free time, and I think that um, uh, this can be used for uh, productively, for 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 example, for projects that we uh, never had time to. Uh, uh, to get to um, getting rid of the clutter, uh, scanning uh, old letters uh, or old family photos, um, exploring music and art on the internet, uh, registering to online courses. I mean, these are all uh, wonderful opportunities that we now have because one resource that we have a lot of is, is no time. Reading a novel we always wanted to read but never managed to get to and so on. Um, but the current threat, I think, can also lead to what we uh, trauma experts call, um, uh, refer to as post-traumatic growth. Uh, by this term, we mean that th these challenging times uh, can help people realize uh, their own capacities to, to withstand difficult times, to survive and prevail. Um, the unusual times, I think, also provide us with an opportunity to realize the unity of mankind. This is such an unusual situation, so, you know, in the past, when we had such such crisis in Israel, we were the only ones. 
uh, the rest of the world carried on. But here we have, I know I'm sharing with you an experience that uh, you are uh, going through, um, you know, in parallel, uh, thousands of miles away. away. So these are unusual times. They, they, uh, the pandemic, I think, is also a real uh, social equalizer. Everyone goes through the same kind of an experience. Uh, and um, it also, I think, gives us an opportunity to um, sort of reassess um, what is important to us, uh, to really appreciate the smaller things in life, uh, those uh, smaller things that are abundant and free and we don't pay attention to. Uh, um, Men, some of us will might might discover um, other meanings in life, such as in spirituality and the value of family. So, this is an opportunity, also an opportunity to rediscover intimacy, to rediscover friendships, um, and the value of pausing to to reflect, uh, to reflect about what is important and what is it that they truly value in life. Absolutely. No, it's, it's fascinating. And uh, honestly, I could, I could ask you probably another hour or two of my own personal questions around this to yourself. Uh, but I think it's time to start to bring in some questions that we've received from our audience. Again, just to remind people if they'd like um, to submit questions to Dr. Zomer, that you can do so on the Q&A uh, option at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, so the first question from an audience member is talks about the importance in establishing a predictable daily routine. How important is that for the mind and for the body to get into that predictable daily routine on a daily basis um, to kind of have everything, you know, uh, scheduled? It, it's very important. We don't want to uh, become uh, compulsive about it, but at times when things are not the same, when everything changes, uh, we want to keep something, some things constant. And also at times when we are out of control of what is going on, we want to establish uh, a domain that is that we can manage and that we can control. For example, our our uh, our daily schedule. So I think this is a, a factor that could have a positive impact on emotional well-being. Mm -hmm. Another another question um, from the audience. Uh, is is what is the impact of cancellations of uh, psychological and psychiatric appointments? A lot of people are unable to go meet with their with their psychiatrists or their therapists during these times. I know a lot of things are going digital, but it's not it can't, you know a hundred percent transformation of the digital world. Who knows if that's happening? What, what do you think the impact of it is that people can't go see their you know their professionals? Well, again, uh, as I said, the pandemic is a, is a big uh, equalizer, a social equalizer. So um, um, this difficulty is something that is shared by many and also by the therapists themselves who cannot go to places where they might have wanted to go. But uh, again, this is, uh, we we're talking psychotherapy. Um, not every every treatment is uh, of of the same disorder. Some problems, of course, uh, particularly those associated with attachment, with the early disruptions of attachments, with early childhood abuse. Uh, those kind of conditions require a, a continuity, and I think maintaining continuity is very important to the prevention of uh, of uh, various post traumatic symptoms. Uh, that could exacerbate the already existing uh, conditions. So I would ask my patients if they, if they want to, uh, to continue and then find creatively ways, ways for them to continue the therapy online. This is again, but not, not always a very simple uh, option. Why? Because at home, some people don't have the privacy, the sense of privacy. Uh, because uh, some some people don't even want their families to know that they're in therapy, but if they do know, they are they could they could uh, have concerns that uh, they will be heard, that uh, mm -hmm. the, there will be leakage of voice or sound, and uh, that that creates a sense of discomfort. Uh, 
But that could also be uh, overcome with, uh, with some creativity. Uh, people can use earphones, so the therapist will not be heard. And people can respond, for example, in chat. So not, no sound will be emitted. But right. um, again, for many, a continuation uh, of a routine is important. Certainly the routine of psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. uh, another question that we've received from the audience, um, is, Dr. Zomer, what do you anticipate the psychological effects will be once people are reintroduced into society after the restrictions are lifted? Um, I think that uh, for most, for most of the population, there'll be jubilation. <laughs> People will be uh, able to savor what um, what they have taken for granted: the ability to go to the beach, to take long walks, to go to the park, to go to the cinema, to uh, mingle with others, to hug again their their friends and acquaintances without worrying. I think there'll be a sense of great relief. However, again, there are, there's always you know, a, a, a risk population. I th for example, just to give an example, um, this pandemic uh, uh, requires many of us to develop uh, compulsive, uh, compulsive uh, habits and behaviors. For example, the hand washing and, uh, and the not touching and the touching and opening doors with the elbow and so on and so forth. Uh, nor, under normal circumstances, this would be a pathological behavior. Uh, so I would uh, predict that, uh, particularly for those who are anxiety prone, that we, we will see uh, an increase in obsessive compulsive behaviors and worries about contamination. Yeah, that makes, uh, that makes sense, uh, absolutely. Um, another question from the audience is, what can we be doing to help our loved ones get through this? Is there specific things that we can do you know, physically? Uh, obviously visiting is, is hard, especially with the elderly, but you know, or certain you know, reinforcements that we can be saying to them, but is there anything that you could give advice on how, you know, if we have a loved one that is you know, particularly panicked by the situation, what we can do to help them get through it and calm them down? Yeah, well, first help them uh, uh, monitor their exposure to the threatening, threatening information and uh, see if you can um, um, get them to agree to uh, receive the uh, warring information from, from you, their emotional caretaker only. That's one thing, to sort of to cut down, to reduce on the, uh, on the stressful, stressful stimulation that they're exposed to. Uh, but you know, I, I could go on with with a long list. But I, I let me let me uh, focus on I think one that is sounds simplistic. I've alluded to it already, but it, it is it is extremely valid. Um, maintain, strengthen, fortify the social bonding with your loved ones. This is a wonderful opportunity to amend old rifts, to overcome old grudges. Uh, and to and and to uh, fortify and strengthen family relationships and bonds. Uh, this will be a particular challenge now with the seder coming. Um, usually, um, you know, a big uh, yearly family gathering, a source of joy for many. Uh, the equivalent, I guess, for the uh, Thanksgiving dinner in America that could be stressful to others. But again, this is an opportunity to not to forget those who are alone, those, I mean, we will all be separated in our own little apartments and homes. So one thing that I, ha I personally um, suggested uh, to uh, some family members who will not be able to join us, that we will conduct our Seder pretty much on the platform that we are using now like with Zoom. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Um, I think the, the final question that we'll ask the, that comes from the audience is, again, I think going back to uh, one that you answered, but if you have any additional advice, you know, when the pandemic starts to curb down and, you know, the, the, our leadership is saying that it's safe to, you know, to go outside and to continue with the daily activities and things of that nature, what can you tell people that are still, you know, very anxious about going outside that, you know, maybe the leadership says it's right, but I'm still supposed to be in quarantine and I'm having anxiety about heading outside and going for a walk. 
what can you tell people to feel more comfortable, um, you know, listening to, to their, to their leadership? Right. Well, uh, to be anxious about contagion uh, under normal circumstances would consist, constitute a, uh, an, perhaps an obsessive worrying disorder, but under the current circumstances it is normal. So the challenge here is to decide what is normal and what is abnormal. So when all the experts tell you it is safe, the, the all clear sound is, is, being, is, is, is on and, and um, it is safe now to resume with normal life. And people you know are still uh, um, confined uh, defensively in their homes. I would say what has developed here is a is a phobia, a fear, a, a irrational fear. And let me say that the only way to overcome a phobia is by exposure. This is not you, you can talk about, about it and rationalize, or, but unless people go out there and realize that they do, they they carry out with a normal behavior and that no catastrophe happens, they will not be able to integrate this new information that all is safe. So when we get to this stage, encourage all those who are anxious uh, to go out and perhaps walk with them, model normal behavior, so they'll be able to reintegrate quickly into normal life. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Zomer. And uh, for the audience, uh, for the questions that we did not get to, uh, I deeply apologize. We are on a, um, on, on, a, on a time schedule, but uh, if you want to email any other questions that you have to info at asuh.org, um, info at asuh.org, we'll pass those questions along to Dr. Zomer, and um, I'm sure he'd be happy to, uh, to answer them. Um, thank you so much for your time, doctor. This was a, this was a real pleasure, and it was a uh, you know, very fascinating conversation. I'll now pass it over to Karen Berman for some closing remarks. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Jake. And again, thank you, Dr. Zomer. I just want to thank all of you for uh, joining us this afternoon. Um, you know, we're hoping that uh, some of the, the information, the, the real news versus the fake news can help get us all through this crisis together. And as we have more and more uh, facts and more and more information on a number of different areas, we're looking forward to sharing it with you. Uh, and we will have a regular schedule of these types of webinars in addition to other postings and um, videos available for you with all the information coming out via our email and Facebook. Um, as Jake said, please don't hesitate to reach out if you have more questions or even suggestions, and we'd love to uh, be able to help you with any of that. So I just want to thank everyone again, wishing you all much um, health and safety and uh, at least some good views from your window if you can't get outside. Thanks all. Mm -hmm.